All right, good afternoon. I'm synchronized to the uh, worldwide Apple clock on my phone, and it says 3.30, so I figured we should get started. Um, let me start with a couple questions. Um, that is me. I'm Jackson Shaw, not somebody else pinch hitting for me. And uh, I work uh, at this company called One Identity, which um, actually you probably haven't heard very much about, but um, is a company I've worked at since 2005. We've gone through various transformations. I joined a company called Quest Software, which got, by, got bought by um, a small company called Dell, and we got put into Dell Software Group, and then a few years later, um, Mr. Dell um, decided that he didn't need software anymore and spun us out, uh, and we got uh, leverage bought out by Francisco Partners here in town, and uh, resurfaced as Quest Software, and we re resurfaced as the one identity portion, so I'm, I'm an identity management guy and have been for many years, as you can tell from my gray hair. So um, I want to talk a little bit today about passwords and fingerprints and faces, uh, comparing old and new authentication, and just you know to have a little bit of a discussion about um, how I see some things changing around uh, this area. So let me just ask a question. How many folks have an iPhone? OK. How many folks have, uh, if, you, if, you, if you have the iPhone or you have a Samsung or you have something, something that does biometric fingerprint authentication? OK. How many folks are using the spanking brand new iPhone 10? Few? OK. You, so you got some experience with facial. Uh, put your hand up if you would walk away tomorrow from using your fingerprint or facial and go back to passcodes and passwords if you could. Anyone, one person. <laughs> oh, two people. Okay, awesome. All right. Uh, I'll buy your iPhone X from you at the end of this if, uh, if, if you want to sell it. Um, okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about this. I'm going to kind of walk you through um, some of the pros and cons and I guess some of the history. And just for you folks... Uh, I'll give you one historical anecdote. Um, this is what uh, Bill Gates uh, said you know, a number of years ago at this conference, in fact, at RSA. Uh, and uh, at that point in time, I was working for Microsoft. Um, in fact, I was the product manager for Active Directory, and I thought this was really interesting that I was sitting up in my office in Redmond, and I saw this, and there was the byline of the password is dead, and I said, gee, Bill didn't call me to ask me about what I thought about the password being dead. But... Um, uh, and another anecdote I'll give you is I was the one guy, I mean, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with Microsoft back then, but they did come out with a line of biometric keyboards and mice. And I was the only proponent internally within the um, security and AD team that wanted to use those devices for AD authentication. Uh, but I got overruled by the security gods at Microsoft and no one would allow uh, biometrics to be used for AD authentication. Now you fast forward now, FIDO2 and all these other things that are going out, lots of announcements about Windows 10 and hello today. If you follow Alex Simons from Microsoft on Twitter, lots of discussion today about the password being dead. So we've gone a long way. Uh, and I wanna talk a little bit about that. But I thought just, you know, uh, I was thinking about this when I was preparing these slides and I thought about Bill's talk uh, and, and uh, how he started this whole moniker of the password is dead. So um, I thought it'd be appropriate to show this from, from literally when he first announced this in 2004, right? So we've gone, what, 14 years? And I don't know about you, but I'm... How many of you guys every day are doing something to reset a password? I mean, literally every day. Somewhere, one of your sites, something's forgotten. Oh, my God, it's like every day. It's crazy. Anyway, so in the meantime, since Bill made this pronouncement... Um, probably some of this you, you know. Um, I think some of these numbers are a little low. I have way more than 27 discrete online logins. I can tell you that right now. In fact, I'm down to the point where every day I'm getting an email about some such crap that's going on that is causing me an issue. Yesterday it was um, uh, a site that I, I don't even know when I signed up. They wrote me and told me that my, my, my user ID has been compromised in the dark web and for safety's sake, they were going to uh, reset my password and ask me, or change my password and ask me to reset it. My problem is now, I think everybody's uh, uh, either password or credential has already been uh, hacked in and is in the dark web, so um, that wasn't very helpful to me. 
Uh, if you're an internal enterprise guy, that's where I come from. My background is all enterprise. Um, you know, 20, 50% of help desk calls are password resets. $25 each, people could say they're more. But it's, it's, a, it's a, a shed load of money that you're paying, um, you know, if I, again, if I go back to my, H, my, my, password, or my Microsoft days, we were paying HP to man our service desk. Uh, and those people were getting paid, I think, something like $32 a reset or something like that. So it's a lot of money. There's been a whole cottage industry uh, built up around um, helping folks with passwords and issues around passwords, uh, including my own company. We have a self-service password reset tool that probably sell you know, 10, 20 copies of it a day. And if you went on the show floor, as I, I did today, and walked around the booths, lots of people pushing you know, personal password managers, um, you know, single sign-on and federation, and all the different solutions for uh, passwords. Uh, the chap that was in here before me, or the folks that were in here before me, were talking about um, um, stronger authentication, uh, verifiable identification, uh, some of the, the new NIST standards, uh, and of course there's government ID systems, and the guy uh, earlier was talking about global entry. Um, but generally speaking, the costs around maintaining these passwords um, continue to rise. Uh, it's the, 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 the um, you know, what it's forcing us as, as employees or security people inside companies to do and what, what it's costing the, the, the employees at the end of the day is, is not getting any easier. There we go. 63% of all breaches involve weak default or stolen passwords. Um, I, I'm doing another talk over in, in Europe a little while and I'm, I was thinking a bit about this. Um, yeah, everybody remember the Sony hack? Hopefully there's not too many people from Sony in here. If you are, I apologize. Um, but, you know, I, I talk to a lot of senior security people at companies and they go, well, you know, and I, we, we have a privileged account management password product and I go and I talk to them about why it's really important to secure your privileged passwords and your root account and your Azure AD account and all this stuff. And, and people go, well, you know, we already secure those or, you know, they're written down somewhere and locked in a safe. And um, I say to them, the problem isn't the fact that you're thinking about securing them or you've written them down on a piece of paper and you've locked it in a safe so that if you have a break glass emergency, you can get them. The problem is that um, the intelligent hacker today, which seems to be about everybody, are looking for a non-privileged account. Because in the Sony hack, if you, if you read it, just go in and type in anatomy of the Sony hack, you can sort of read through what happened. Uh, and one of the graphics I cut out, like I cut out this graphic for this one, uh, one of the graphics I cut out is one of the first things these folks did when they got into the Sony network is you log on as Jackson, who's a non-privileged user, and I go to one of my network shares that is available because I authenticated, and you type in directory password dot star, and a whole bunch of files pop up that say password something. Uh, or you do a, uh, you do a, 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 you know, a grep or something along that line. And the, 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 the graphic I cut out was the fact that um, one of the documents that was released by the hackers was this screenshot that showed all these password files. And again, this is a, a symptom of what's happened is a lot of folks who are in the security business or folks that aren't in the security business write passwords down in a Excel spreadsheet or in a Word doc and store them somewhere. Uh, and then, of course, the, the, the guys who are hacking Sony aren't looking for Jackson's Unix root password. I mean, if they stumbled across it, they would be pretty happy if you were using it at the airport. But what they're doing is looking for the files where everybody who's, I'll say, lazy or doesn't care or we've just put them through, through so many hoops um, that um, they're writing this stuff down. So. You know, the, the, the point being that risks just continue to rise and there's just more and more systems um, that we have to remember passwords to. Um, you know, federation, single sign-on, um, and even privileged account management, and this is the business I'm in, I see people who hand out the keys of the kingdom. Here's your federated credential, you can go and do all these things across your company. I can do ADP, I can do concur, I can do expense paying, I can, I can write checks, I can do all kinds of things, but I don't use um, two-factor authentication to secure that credential. Not a good thing. Um, so the, the risks continue to ri uh, rise along all these different technologies that, that, that we're, we're firing up. 
So the industry and technology have rallied to help, myself included, of course, um, you know, building things like tokens and, um, you know, I mentioned password wallets and the Federation and single sign-on and QR codes. And as I say here, my, my little euphemism, everyone and their dog are creating software tokens. If you were around in the days of when we thought the smart card would take over, you saw people with their necklace and they had a bunch of different smart cards on it, or now you see people with their necklace and a bunch of OTP things on it. Um, or, you know, now it's, you know, using LastPass or something like that. Uh, I, I was talking to a, uh, uh, a uh, chocolate manufacturer in, in, in um, um, I'm trying to narrow it down. I'm trying to make it broad enough so you can't guess which one. One of the major chocolate manufacturers in Europe. Um, uh, and uh, they want to store, they want to now their, uh, enable their employees to store their personal passwords in a, in a vaulting product. Um, because they're concerned about all, all the people who are now starting to store privileged passwords in, you know, something like a personal password product. So, like I say, the, the risks are, the risks are, are getting um, um, greater and the usability is not getting greater. I mean, literally, almost every day, if not every other day, I've got some kind of an issue. I forgot a password uh, or I'm being told that I need to change my password. Um, I think last, last week there was something else, I don't know who it was, but somebody else sent me an email that they had a security breach and it would be a good idea to change your password. I mean, how many, you guys all must get those, right? Weekly? Weekly? Almost, yeah. So, um, you know, the dark web is the place to find compromised credentials. Um, I didn't know about this uh, uh, pawned, uh, um, you know, site, have I been, have I been pawned? or pwned, or however it's pronounced. Um, and uh, I actually entered my stuff uh, a, a while ago for another presentation I was doing, and my uh, user ID was found on nine sites that were breached, and my password has been seen <laughs> three, <laughs> 3 million times, 3.3 million times. So uh, not, not so good. But, you know, I, I love this thing and, and, you know, people are incorporating this into, um, into um, password set products and they're incorporating into commercial sites and, and, and uh, e-commerce sites. Like I mentioned to you, I got an email yesterday or the day before saying, hey, we found your, that your, your credential is on the, on the uh, dark web and would you please change your password for your protection. Uh, my, my concern is that, you know, uh, pretty soon the, 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 the intersection set of uh, uh, pwned, you know, passwords and credentials and what you have on yourself are going to be the same. You know, as soon as you have, I mean, jackson.shotgmail.com is my standard personal address. I, I'm not going to change that every time, you know, it, it shows up on the dark web. But um, in some ways, that's what people are thinking. But it's, it's gotten to the point now where these guys are so fast that it's really hard to try to keep up with, you know, where your credentials have been used, where your user ID has been used. Uh, if you haven't used it for your um, enterprise credential, try it out. I know with my enterprise credential, my, my uh, jackson.shotquest.com, which is our, our corporate um, email system, um, it shows up there as being also um, compromised. And, you know, I call my IT guys up and, and there's kind of this like very long pause on the end of the phone. You, you did what? So, you know, we're not, we're not really staying up to date with this stuff. Anyway. So uh, I want to talk a little bit now about, you know, where I think we are today, because I think, this, I think we're in an interesting space. Um, you know, I do believe uh, that we're getting close to this tipping point or a series of tipping points around hardware. Uh, biometrics are becoming more acceptable. I mean, literally, I'm going to say five years ago, seven years ago, the, the, the use of biometrics in some cases, not frown, you know, frowned on by a lot of people. Uh, for a bunch of different reasons, including uh, privacy, uh, but also because, um, you know, just the, the, the software and the hardware, there was impedance mismatches everywhere. Um, you know, even when I work for Dell, I have a Dell laptop, um, and it, it, it ships with a biometric, you know, reader thing on it, and it didn't ship with the driver software, and our IT people didn't uh, turn on the drivers or turn on the, the thing, so... Um, you know, couldn't use it as much as I wanted to use it because I have used it in previous roles and it's, I, I liked it, so I wanted to use it, but I uh, couldn't use it. Uh, how many people using Windows laptops, Windows 10, Windows Hello? Few people. So I, I guess 
That's what I use, but I guess because my IT department hasn't turned it on, there's some facial recognition or there's some various different tokens you can use that make your life easier. Uh, my point just being that if your IT department isn't forward thinking or your IT department is, isn't thinking about this stuff, um, that's a problem in itself too. So biometrics are becoming more acceptable. I'm at, I'm at the point now uh, with my iPhone certainly and, and the iPhone 10 and, and the facial biometrics that you're not prying that phone out of my, you know, what is it? What is the saying about the guns? Uh, you can pry it out of my cold dead finger, something like that. But that's the same with my, my iPhone now. Um, I do believe that uh, it's, it's a game changer. Uh, the, biomet the facial biometrics, I believe Samsung is, if they haven't released something, are, are in the in the process, but it's probably my Canadian coming out process, I think. Is it process or process here? Process. Process, okay, sorry. I've lived here since 99, but a few words I just don't get. Um, so securing account information is becoming easier. The, the secure enclave, how many people use Apple Pay or use, use NFC? They do some kind of payment with their, with their thing? 30%, 40% of the office? Uh, you guys trust it more? Well, you must if you're using it, right? I trust it, I paid for it. My coffee at Starbucks, I paid for my pizza kitchen thing last night. I love it. Have you ever looked at it? Like you get that credit card receipt and you look at the credit card number and you see the credit card number that's on there. You know, they put XXXX in the last four digits don't match your four digits because they've created a secure token that can only be used once. That's why I like it because my credit card isn't being stored somewhere. Uh, and have you, have, have you heard that, you know, everybody's got these chip cards now? You know, you go to, I go to my pavilions down in LA and I put my chip card in and enter my little code and I pay for it. Well, that whole purpose of that was so that those folks didn't store your credit card number, but now we're hearing that the credit, that they're still storing your credit card numbers regardless. So, you know, so much for that. Um, but uh, my point being that the secure enclave that, that Apple and the chip, the hard piece of hardware that they've built, um, I have no reason to doubt the veracity of what Apple says about not being able to get to it and how it's protected. Um, I think there's some pretty cool stuff that's going on around FIDO and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then of course TPM or trusted platform modules if I remember what that stands for. And, uh, chips and cloud-based hardware security modules are all much more ubiquitous now. Um, I think almost every laptop and server ships with a TPM chip so you can store passwords, you can store keys, you can store various things in it. Um, same with laptops, but my, my general point being that I don't think they're as interoperable as something as simple as an iPhone. So around software, um, again, five, seven, nine years ago, around, maybe not even nine years ago, we're, we're not that long into the whole cloud thing. Uh, everybody was concerned about the cloud and cloud security. Oh my God, I'll never store data in the cloud. Uh, it's you know switched 180. And I won't say 180 degrees, but let's say 100 and you know 50 degrees. Uh, I was meeting a uh, large uh, insurance provider yesterday for lunch, and and they're like, oh no, we're totally cloud first. Put it put it all put it all in the cloud. We'll put anything in the cloud at this point in time. Uh, I met with one of the credit card processing companies, and they were kind of the same. Um, if the value is there for us to do this, we'll put it in the cloud. It's not a consideration anymore that it's not cloud. It's we want to put it in the cloud unless we can prove that it's not secure for some reason. And then there's a lot of questions about, you know, compliance and SOC this and, you know, that kind of jazz. But the other thing I like about the cloud is, um, and, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of work on the cloud right now, but it's patch and done security. You find a problem, you patch it, it's fixed for everybody. Um, you know, we've been shipping on-prem software for many, many years. And if I want to get a software patch out to 12,000 of my customers, that's not an easy thing, right? You got to send emails and the people who you send the email to doesn't work there anymore. Um, so a lot of that security is really tough. So um, I, lo I love the cloud for that perspective. Um, there's a lot of great solutions that are coming out if, if you know, again, this is just my Microsoft slip showing because I used to work there, but Azure Identity Protection is, is pretty cool. Um, you know, analyzing millions or billions of authentications every day and saying, hey, these look abnormal and we're gonna do something about them or we're gonna prevent people from logging in because we see something fishy going on here. So there's a lot more being done around things like behavioral analysis, risk-based authentication. I mean, I travel a ton. I was in Nice, France last week. I showed up here for, for this and everything I logged into thought that I was a hacker because I'd gone from Nice to and showed up in San Francisco. Um, so I was having to re-enter my passwords and get the text messages and you know all that jazz. Um, I mean, good, uh, but 
you know, still a little funky. Um, as I say here, risk-based access, temporal, location, conditional, a lot of those capabilities are there now, um, either in the software you have or should be uh, if you're checking passwords and doing things like that. Um, you know, passwords are starting to get a, a half-life, and, you know, I, uh, I was at lunch today and I was talking to somebody and I said, you know, when I started my career, um, um, it was, you know, I was a Fortran programmer on a card punch, you know, using an IBM main, mainframe. And then when, you know, the PC came out and Bandian Vines and Novell Netware and things started to speed up, uh, there was a lot of discussion about the mainframe being dead. How many companies still have mainframes? If you're working in, wow, it's more people than are using Apple Pay. Um, so, you know, my point being that the half-life of the mainframe is pretty darn long, right? Um, I thought by the time I was getting retired, which is not that far, you know, down my little horizon, um, that the mainframes would be gone. And, um, you know, I, uh, uh, I'm very blessed that I uh, had our, our first grandchild born in July, July 1st, Canada Day, uh, this past summer. And I was saying to these folks that um, my guess is that my son will be retiring whenever and the password will still be there because the half-life is going to be very long on the password. But, um, you know, it'll be, it'll be interesting someday that, uh, I, you know, I personally think we'll have driverless cars before we get rid of the password, but that's, that's just my, my bet. And like I mentioned here, there's a, a strong uh, usability issue with shorter half-lives. Uh, who wants to change passwords more frequently? None of us here want to change passwords more frequently, right? Um, I, I know I don't. Um, the fact that I have to change mine every 45 days at work is, is, is already tough enough. Okay, so quick run through some of the strength, weakness, opportunity, threats with a few of these things. Uh, well, everybody understands what a password is. Uh, it's legacy. We've all, we've all been through them, so that's a strength. Um, you know, some of the weaknesses are infinite ways passwords have been implemented. Over time, I've seen all kinds of crazy schemes. Uh, lots of policy differences. This is one of the key things. You know, on the mainframe, you can only have an eight-letter, uh, an eight-character password, and it has to all be in uppercase. On, um, you know, Active Directory, it can be up to 164 characters and, you know, all these different things. Um, so there's an impedance mismatch between all of these different systems. Um, the sticky note syndrome, I, I um, had an opportunity to sit down with a CIO one night and, or CISO one night or one afternoon and he said, guess what, I, w I did last night. And I said, what? He said, well, I waited until everybody went home and I walked around and I flipped over keyboards and I found a lot of passwords. Um, and I mean, okay, well... <laughs> <laughs> Probably could have saved him the effort. I'm sure you'd find them without going and looking. But I mean, this this still happens. Um, I mean, you guys probably see it on TV all the time, where some news reporter is in. Where was it? The, well, the when Hawaii turned on the tsunami alarm or whatever it was, and everybody got the uh, the, the alert. And uh, the news people were there, and they filmed it. Uh, they were filming the guys in that uh, bunker or whatever up in the Diamond Head or wherever it is. And uh, right on the, on the monitor was the sticky note for the emergency alert system with the password. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's not getting any better. Uh, and there's a lot of threat vectors related to storage. I mean, if people can grab a password file, um, they'll run dictionary attacks against it all day long. And, um, you know, those are easy to crack. So what are the opportunities? Um, FIDO 2.0, we'll talk a little bit about um, integration of SMS and OTP and push to approve or what I call push to confirm. Um, I think these are, these are interesting innovations where if you're doing something with a password, you can be challenged either to enter a token or you could be challenged with a, uh, a yes, no on your smartphone if you've got a, um, 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 a smart app. Um, you know, you can say yes or no to a password checkout or whatever it is that the person's doing um, and, uh, you know, get an indication of whether it's correct or not. Uh, and then, you know, uh, integration with dark web compromised accounts and credentials and enforcement. We've had a number of customers come to us and say, hey, could you integrate with some of these solutions? And there's guys here on the show floor that actually get all of these um, compromised credentials, user IDs and passwords, create a big database and you can check against that. So we have had customers who say to us, hey, could you check and, and, and prevent customers, our employees, from changing to a compromised password, one that's been compromised and is in a, in a dictionary? I said, yeah, we could, we could do that. But I think that's probably not got a very long half-life because um, you know, more and more of these, these hacks you see every day, uh, the passwords are all getting, getting you, know, you have to get these goofy passwords which make it worse. 
Um, so some of the threats, I think biometrics are a threat to, to password. I mean, it's the whole reason I'm here, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. It's a good threat. Uh, the long tail of any replacement. Again, passwords are going to be around for everybody. Uh, usability. Usability always trumps security, um, unless you're in the military um, and you don't have a choice. But generally speaking, if, if I can do something to make it easier, I will, I will do that. Thank you. I will do that. Uh, and of course, the dark web is, is a big threat. So everybody's seen the uh, gummy bear biometric fingerprint attack or heard of it? No? So when, when people started first doing uh, fingerprint for biometrics, there was a couple of scholarly papers produced about how you could use a gummy bear, you know, put your fingers on it or transfer it off of a bottle or, you know, you've seen this stuff on Homeland or whatever, and uh, use that to, to authenticate. In fact, on, was it Homeland? Was it Homeland the other night where they used, uh, they used the guy's dead finger to open up his iPhone? I don't know if you saw that. Anyway, um, um, so we've been using fingerprints for many years. I mean, my son uses it when he, when he goes to work at In-N-Out Burger and, and, and various people use this. We've been using them for a long time. Timekeeping, like I say, physical access into computer rooms and whatever. Um, I'm, an, I'm an immigrant to this country. I came here in 1999. I, don't care about my fingerprints anymore in the government because I had to give them about eight gazillion times as I was going through my green card process. Uh, process, sorry. Um, <laughs> fortunately, that wasn't on my citizenship exam. Please pronounce this word. Um, and uh, uh, you know, at the borders, uh, which I, I'm sure, I mean, for all the folks that have global entry, how many? Also very convenient. Just put your fingerprints and, and away you go. I'm. I'm literally off the plane at LA airport and out the door to get my taxi in usually less than 10 minutes. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, so again, that's just a point about usability trumping security in this particular case and why I use it. Many laptops ship with scanners, as I mentioned, but heck, doesn't help you if they're not enabled. Um, and uh, when you look at having to protect things that are, that are server-based, servers typically don't have this stuff, and then you have to worry about how do I get the equipment, if you've ever had to deal with, uh, how many people use smart cards in their, in their company for authentication? Okay, a few people. So if you've ever had to deal with smart cards, you know that there's, uh, you need drivers and you know, things that dangle off the side that you can put your smart card in. And um, uh, you know, it's just more hardware to, to not work. So let's see, where are we? One more time. Here we go. Fingerprint SWAT, um, nothing to remember. You got your fingerprints, you don't have to worry about anything. Uh, it's pretty, pretty easy. Uh, it ships in the iPhone and with other manufacturers. Uh, um, sorry, I talk a lot about Apple and the iPhone because when I left Microsoft, I sold all my Microsoft stock and bought Apple, so I'm always trying to promote Apple. Um, um, you know, uh, it, there's off target secret storage. I'm really happy. Again, I have to trust what Apple has told me. I'm really happy that Apple has a secure enclave and they store my credentials here, not on one of their corporate servers, not in one of my corporate, you know, my employer's servers. Um, that's the way I like my credentials to be stored in my, in my hand, so to speak, in my, in my phone. Um, uh, it's uh, typically the way, bi uh, the way biometrics work is it's a mathematical representation of the biometric. Uh, I mean, it's not a photograph of your fingerprint stored somewhere and compared. There's some kind of algorithm that's, that's done to mathematically look at the fingerprint and store that somewhere. So if it's compromised, you're just compromised the hash of the fingerprint as opposed to the actual fingerprint. Unless you're the OMB and you've stored a bunch of pictures of fingerprints for employees and you get hacked and they get stolen. So um, I advise you if you're ever doing anything around biometrics, don't store biometrics raw anywhere. Um, so weaknesses, uh, in a lot of cases they require positive enrollment. If you want, uh, if you want a global entry card, you've got to show up in an office and get enrolled. If you, want, uh, if you work in a hospital, my son started uh, a, a job as an um, orthopedics resident in Las Vegas. He has to get his FDA approval to dispense narcotics, and you can only get that FDA approval and that authority to dispense uh, uh, narcotics by doing um, a level three verification, which is show up in person and prove that you're Dr. So-and-so. Where's your license? Where's your ID? Where's your passport? That kind of jazz. Um, I just got my California Real ID card. Same thing. I had to show up in person with my passport, with my proof of you know, being a California resident. 
Uh, there's issues around uh, sensor acquisition and cleanliness. The, uh, uh, you know, every time I bring up uh, um, fingerprint biometrics, people will rib me or will, will, will say to me, well, what about the, the gummy bear uh, attack, uh, which happened a long time ago, but people seem to, to remember it. Um, and of course, it requires application in integration. So, um, you know, you're kind of stuck with this. I, I put up a picture of anybody who's a Delta frequent flyer. I am. Uh, I would rather not be a frequent flyer if I could uh, not be one, believe me. Um, but you can get into the Delta clubs now by, you know, scanning a fingerprint, apparently. I haven't tried it yet, but it's there. Um, so threats, privacy misunderstanding. Uh, the <laughs> there's always the group of people who wear the tinfoil hats. Uh, we don't want them to know our, our fingerprints. Um, that's always an issue. And then uh, just general usability, uh, because anything that's easier to use uh, is typically what a customer will, will end up using. So let's talk about facial biometrics for a second because um, I do think um, this is a, a really interesting area. Um, if you've, uh, and some of the folks have the, the 10, uh, so you've, you've obviously lived this a little bit. Um, so the iPhone X I do believe is a catalyst. Uh, attentive face, uh, it won't open if my eyes are closed. Uh, if I'm not looking at it, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty good from a lot of different angles, but um, you have to have an attentive face. So you can't, you know, my, my son can't walk up to me at night and open up my iPhone if my eyes are closed and, and do a bank transfer or something. Uh, it's apparently, again, this is, um, I think I've got URLs for, for these papers if you want to read them, but it's a, the True Death camera projects 30,000 dots on your face, uh, produces a, a depth match and a 2D, 2D infrared image. Um, and uh, the interesting thing is if you use it enough or you, you, you've used it for a while, you realize that sometimes it fails or after a restart, you have to enter your passcode in to, to, to do it again. Uh, and it's constantly updating that information into the secure enclave. And what I like about that is, and I was pretty, pretty amazed by this. Um, I go out in the afternoon to walk my dog. I put a baseball cap on. My, my glasses go black because I've got that changing stuff. And after a few times, a few days of this, and it not, you know, opening and asking for my passcode, it starts to self-remember um, these changes. So it comes up with these, these algorithms so that, you know, as I grow a mustache, which I can't do, so that'll never be the case, or as I grow a beard, which, again, I can't do, so that'll never be the case. But for the folks that do, uh, it happens over a, a sufficient period of time, where I guess if you put weight on or take weight off, um, usually I'm on the more putting on aspect, um, the Apple device um, just starts to, to see that and remember that so you don't run into these situations where six months from now, you know, it just doesn't work. So it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, there is an API for Face ID, um, um, you know, and uh, uh, passcodes in, key, in, in the keychain. Uh, what I like about that, again, um, is just the, the fact that that means there is now a point for you being a company or a developer or, or uh, uh, an individual to start integrating with Face ID. And I think, again, that's back to this tipping point. I'm a huge believer in the API economy. And if you, again, if you're using um, the, any of the phones with, with, with fingerprint stuff, you've probably used your bank account app and been asked to uh, authenticate with your fingerprint or with your, bio, your facial biometric and the app opens and you can do things. Um, that's an example of how people are integrating with this API. And uh, it's the ease of use, I believe, that's going to make um, this uh, a, lot more, uh, a lot more interesting for us over time. So nothing to remember, and it's non-repudiable. Uh, actually, fingerprints are non-repudiable -repudi non also. What I mean by that is I can't hand you my iPhone or say that someone stole my iPhone and we're able to use the, the, the biometrics to get in and transfer a million dollar wire transfer. Uh, it's non-repudiable. I knew it was you. Um, I think Apple has admitted that perhaps with a twin brother or twin sister, there may be an issue, but generally speaking, I think it's pretty, it's pretty close. Uh, chips in the iPhone X, as I mentioned, and other phone manufacturers. Uh, the iPhone X learns, and I talked a little bit about that. Um, off-target secret storage, again, in the secure enclave um, so of the device that's in your hand as opposed to somewhere else. And according to their papers, and, and again, I have no reason to disbelieve them. Uh, this has been shipping since October, and I have yet to really read anything uh, that would purport to have broken this. Uh, there's a one in a million probability of a false positive. Um, and I've got some stats just on the other things here uh, pretty soon. 
Uh, again, Fido Tua, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, let's see here, what else? We talked about oh, biometrics and analytics. Um, Specialist cameras remain a barrier to adoption. Intel's got their RealSense camera and some of the Dell laptops and some of the other things. But again, we're back into the hardware and have in all these different devices. Having the biometric capability on a, on a phone or, or a device that you pretty much carry with you all the time is, is, is pretty significant, in my opinion. Um, you know, you may require positive enrollment in some cases if it was a highly secure facility or something like that. They wanna make sure, like, how many people did this? When you got your fingerprint thingy, did you ask your wife to put one of her fingerprints on it so she could open your iPhone if she ever needed to, or your phone? Anybody do that? Oh, lots of people did that, okay, it wasn't just me. Uh, it's kind of hard to do that though with your face, right? You can't do your face and her face, but you can do it with fingerprints. Um, so uh, another potential weakness, uh, business personal mixed use. Some companies you have to use a, a business phone, they, they supply you with a business phone. So there might be differences in capabilities. Uh, right now there's limited enterprise usage, but that's something we're trying to change ourselves as a vendor. Uh, and it also requires uh, app integration. Um, and there's, you know, uh, I'll just, the only threat I'll mention that I haven't already mentioned is 3D printers. I mean, what people can do with 3D printers is pretty amazing nowadays. I mean, you know, you watch all these, these things on TV, it's amazing. Uh, but, um, I know Apple has done a lot of work, and I assume Samsung will do this same work about making sure that they can tell the difference between a really good printed 3D mask and my face. At least I hope so. Otherwise, this whole theory goes out the window. So let's take a look at the, the methods. Uh, a passcode is about one in 10,000. So it's actually a bit less than that. Uh, you've got to do this, uh, you've got to sit there and go, you know, 0000000001. And you guys know that um, with the iPhone, you can set it so that kind of self-destructs if you do this enough times. If you don't have the self-destruct thing turned on, uh, you really should. Um, I've got it turned on. I think it's 10 or 20 or something like that. But I figure if it falls in the hands of a hacker, the thing's backed up every night to the iCloud. I assume Samsung does the same thing. You might as well have the thing, you know, self-destruct or not self-destruct, but erase itself. The problem with passcodes is, you know, you can have more than four, you can have six or, or, or more, but we get back to the same thing. It's like having a password, hard to remember. Um, there's been talk about bypass hacks. I read another article a couple days ago about a bypass hack. Um, and additional security measures should be used. Like, as I said, number of failed entries and some other things. Fingerprint, it's, you know, a half order of magnitude better. It's uh, one in uh, 50,000. But part of the problem, and again, if you've, if you've got a biometric enabled phone, you've seen this, you're at the sports club or you're out in the rain or you know, something happens, you've got a cut on your finger, you're not using that finger, you can't use your phone until you, know, you clean it up or wipe the sweat off it or whatever. Um, calibration can be difficult. Um, again, if you've been through it, you know how many times you've had to calibrate your, your, your fingerprint. Um, in some situations, positive enrollment might be required. Uh, if, you're, if you're, for example, um, if you've got a privileged job or something like that, and, and, and people want to know that it's actually Jackson who's the person who can check out the root password on our Oracle system, uh, you know, and, and cut checks, they may want to make sure that they see me in the HR department and watch me actually do that. Um, you know, passcode is a fallback. App integration is required, which is, which is, of course, is one of the problems with any of this stuff. Facial is uh, one in a million, so it's, a, it's an order of magnitude better than a passcode and, and quite a lot better than a, a, a fingerprint. Uh, in the case of Apple, because I, I don't have experience with Sony, won't work if, the eyes, if your eyes are closed. Uh, it does adapt or it will have to adapt. Um, again, I'm not a Samsung, ex is anybody a Samsung phone person here? Do they have the facial biometrics yet? They do? Okay, so I assume that it, it does similar stuff, adapts uh, to changing facial characteristics or accessories. Again, positive enrollment might be required for certain things. Uh, app integration, integration is required. Um, let's see here. So Fido, uh, John Wave, where are you? Uh, that's uh, John Fontana, he's the co-chair of the Fido uh, working group. Wave again, John, so everyone sees you. If you have Fido questions, please mob John right at the end. Um, I think this is, uh, I cannot do this the justice that I'm sure John can, but I think FIDO is, uh, is pretty interesting. Uh, it's a uh, uh, standards uh, uh, thing based on public key cryptography. Uh, the biometrics, et cetera, aren't stored on the, on the FIDO server. 
It supports password lists and, and hardware-based tokens, and I'll give John a plug. He works for a little company called Ubico. If you know anything about Ubico and YubiKeys, um, again, that's, uh, that's the guys that uh, John works for. Uh, very resistant to phishing and man-in-the-middle attacks, if you've heard about those with respect to passwords. I'm always constantly concerned whenever I'm at an airport or on public Wi-Fi. I mean, you, you guys probably know a little bit about firewalls, but the whole, thank you, the whole point about firewalls is, in a lot of cases, they're doing SSL inspection, so they're actually decrypting the traffic that's hitting the firewall and then looking at it and re-encrypting it and sending it on. Um, so, you know, may not be a good thing to have something in the middle that's looking at your traffic in clear text. If you were a bad person, you know, who knows, right? A lot of key industry players here that are supporting this, including Microsoft and PayPal and Visa and Wells Fargo, and of course what uh, John and his company are doing. Um, he and I were talking just at the start of this about Apple and where Apple is in this because you know Apple is going to be a, a, key, a key player in this. At least I hope they will be a key player. Blockchain, um, I get asked this all the time, what is blockchain going to do for identity? Uh, well, you know, around credentials and, and compromised credentials, you can put these things on the blockchain. Um, tying authenticated devices to an identity, tying social media devices to identities. I think blockchain will, will be an enabler in, in some of these things uh, and in helping to improve trust. I mean, the key thing in my mind is what is blockchain about? It's about helping to improve trust where you can't necessarily have trust. In an internal organization, in an enterprise, you pretty much trust your employees. So you don't have to worry, worry so much about blockchain. But in the rest of the world where we all live and breathe, um, I think there's some, some uses for blockchain. So some final remarks. I don't know why that's small. Uh, Gartner, by the end of 2020, 70% of all enterprises will combine biometric methods, now that's enterprises, biometric methods with analytics and either mobile push um, authentication or embedded public key credentials across multiple use cases up from almost nil today. I totally believe that. Uh, and again, I think that's partially because of Apple and what Samsung are doing. Uh, biometrics are risky to store. You don't want to store them like what the OPM did uh, with 5.6 million people's fingerprints. Uh, biometric authentication, in my belief, is a paradigm shift, uh, but we can't forget about security. Um, what Apple has done, Apple is a market maker, if you're familiar with the term market maker, and that's why I believe they're gonna be successful, or Apple plus Samsung, and possibly Microsoft and others. Um, I, I love the, uh, you know, the thermal to face, face uh, biometrics recognition. Um, I think that's, that's pretty cool. But you know, at the end, passwords have outlived their usefulness. Um, there will be this associated long tail that I mentioned. Um, and let's see here, what else do I have? So there is this whole series of authentication tipping points at hand. Software and hardware uh, seem to be uh, similarly aligned for a change, I think. And I believe that all of these things are a catalyst. FIDO, Microsoft Hello, what's happening around the cloud, risk-based authentication, blockchain, and of course, as I say here, do not underestimate, and I should have said, the Apple, Samsung, or Microsoft effect. These guys are market makers. They start supporting this, they start building it into their products, and you will see the market move with them. Um, you know, I, I, I really believe in this thing at the bottom, delighting your customer. For me, it's employees and companies, and using things like Facial recognition to enable you to check out a password or to log into your system is something that delights an end user. It makes it real easy for them to do their job. Um, so that's a key thing for me and a key thing that I think you guys should be thinking about. So late breaking news, uh, April the 10th, just before I, actually just after I sent in my final of this and I got to send in another final, um, uh, you know, the FIDO Alliance and WC, W3C had a big uh, milestone around uh, what's going on with FIDO. Uh, but web authentication and using Bluetooth and NFC, I think this is really cool stuff. Um, um, I, I wish I had the ability to have had a demo pulled up together for this, uh, for this particular thing. It would have been nice to see it. But I've got a link here in the slides. And if anybody wants the slides, I'll give you my business card. I can send them to you. I think they get posted somehow. Uh, but I'm happy to do that. And I think that's either my... Okay. Uh, RSA wants me to do things like this, which I think is cool. So when you get home, if you don't know about FIDO, please read a little bit about it. I think it's going to be really important. Um, uh, please do uh, take a few minutes and, and read about it. There's a great article on how blockchain affects identity and authentication I would also invite you to read. Uh, if you're interested in Apple Face ID security, there you go. And my, my humble apologies for not including something on Samsung. 
uh, f I, I will go and look at that and update it for my, for my slides if I do this again at, at a point. In the next quarter, propose what critical applications in your enterprise would benefit from push to authenticate, push to comply, or biometrics? Uh, because vendors like myself are building more and more of this into things like the Apple iPhone and, and the Samsung through the uh, various uh, tokens that we're building. Have a discussion with your team management or security folks about implementing a use case for trial. Password reset uh, is the one that I love. Um, gosh, reset your password. You don't need to know any of this historical Q&A stuff. What's your hat size? What's your favorite cocktail? You know, who's your best man? And what, where, what city were you married, with, married in? Uh, you know, put your face up. Yep, that's you. Reset your password. I like that. Um, ask your vendors what their biometric plans are. Are they integrating with Face ID? Are they integrating with FIDO? I have tons of people that come to us every day. You're a big vendor in this area. Would you integrate with our token? And my first question is, do you support FIDO? And you guys should be asking that too. When it comes to authentication with respect to your vendors, ask them if they're going to support FIDO or if they do support FIDO. Very important. And then implement. And I think there is no time for questions. Am I totally out of time? Oh, she's got a sign that says stop. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was trying to leave five minutes for questions. Uh, I'll, I'll stay up here. Um, my email address is right there. Uh, if you want the slides, drop me a note. I'll send them off to you tonight. Thanks for your attention. I really appreciate it. I hope it was useful. <laughs>